Hi, my name is Adrian Kennard and I'm here to tell you a little bit about what is wrong with SFI 2. So the first thing is that uh, we need to understand what we actually buy from companies like BT. And uh, you can see on this nice diagram here, the red bits in the middle are what we actually buy. So uh, the ISP, that's us at one end, we connect on to a host link. And then BT are selling us a connection across their core network uh, through their BVAS, through the DSLAM in the exchange, uh, across the local copper pair or metallic path, right through to the NTE at the premises. And BT are taking responsibility for that whole link. So at the moment, what do BT sell us? Well, what do BT PLC trading as OpenReach say SFI2 is? SFI2 is a chargeable investigation product that attempts to identify and resolve digital subscriber line DSL service affecting problems. Now this makes sense for OpenReach to sell this because OpenReach sell a metallic path service to carriers like BT Wholesale and TalkTalk Talk and others. And that's defined to SYN349, which is a spec for metallic path for telephony. It's not a broadband service. So if you want an investigation and um, resolution to DSL problems on a metallic path, OpenReach charge you, charge you for that. They sell a chargeable service. But what do wholesale say about SFI2? Bear in mind, we're dealing with BT Wholesale here, not OpenReach. They say SFI2 is an OpenReach service which is made available to BT Wholesale customers and charged for on a modular basis. The SFI2 visit simply checks whether a line is working within the specification of SYN349. Now, this is rather odd because we don't buy SYN349, that's metallic path. We buy broadband. So let's try an analogy of what we're talking about here. Uh, imagine Cisco have, well, field engineers, I'm sure they do, and um, I'm sure they offer a service uh, that for a fee they'll come out and work on routers and things for you, change cards, replace kit and so on. Uh, I'm not picking on Cisco here, it's just an example that people will understand. Now suppose BT PLC were to say, a Cisco field engineer uh, is a Cisco service which is made available to BT wholesale customers, just like they're saying SFI is an open reach service made available to BT wholesale customers. Now, that might make sense, you know, if we've got some Cisco kit, you know, BT might have negotiated a good deal for these field engineers to come out. So maybe that's a, a thing we could buy, you never know. But then let's imagine wholesale say, ah yes, but if a BMAS breaks, you'll need to buy one of these Cisco field engineers. Really? But it's your BMAS, surely if it breaks, it's up to you to fix it. Bit mad. How's that different from saying we have to buy an SFI engineer to fix a broadband thing. It's, it's still part of what wholesale sell us. It's just an engineer to fix something that's part of what they sell us, part of what they're responsible for. So that doesn't make sense. That's no different to this third party SFI too. But it gets worse. Imagine that on top of all that madness, they say a Cisco field engineer is only there to check the power lead is plugged in. Anything else is charged. Well, that's crazy. But that's almost as bad as saying the SFI engineer is only there to check SYN349. It's got nothing to do with broadband, whether it meets SYN349 or not. Why would we be paying if it meets SYN349? Why would we need an engineer to go and check it to SYN349? Passing SYN349 is a test done by the PSTN provider. And if it doesn't pass, then they have to fix it to SYN349. Once it meets SYN349, then we can look at broadband faults. So why would we pay someone to test the line to SYN349? It's, it's mental. So just to remind you what they sell us, they sell us everything from the host link to the NTE. They're selling us a broadband service, not metallic path. So you see the problem. BT Wholesale sell us broadband, and part of that is they have to find and fix faults when it breaks. Um, I mean, okay, that might mean them paying a Cisco engineer for BMAS breaks, maybe. Might mean them paying OpenReach if something's wrong on the, on the metallic path on the phone line relating to broadband. But whatever it takes, BT PLC trading as BT Wholesale are responsible and have hence the cost to engage whatever means are necessary to find and fix the faults on their side of the demarcation point. So why would I buy an SFI2? Well, it's an optional service, so I don't have to buy it. Great, yay. But I don't need such a service. I don't have metallic paths that I'm putting broadband on and therefore would want to buy the SFI2 service for that. I buy broadband, not metallic paths. Um, but worse, it's a service that just checks the lines to the 349 if the line doesn't meet SYN349, the phone line provider will fix it, and I can check that, meet SYN349 from the exchange, click of a button, no cost, 
So why would I want to pay someone to do that? It's mental. So you know, why would any ISP buy SFI2 either, with either definition? If it's defined as checking to SIN 349, there's no reason for any ISP to ever buy that. One the line test from the exchange, if it meets SIN 349, bingo, you can now pursue a broadband fault. If it doesn't, contact the PSD inside and get that fixed. Neither of those options involve an engineer testing SIN 349 premises. But even if you look at OpenReach's definition where SFI2 is a service to find and diagnose and fix faults, a useful thing, why would I want to buy that from OpenReach? I don't have lines that I've put modems on at the exchange, which is why I'd want to buy that. But wholesale do, they have lines, they put modems on at the exchange, so they might want to buy such a service. But there's no reason for me to buy it. I've already bought broadband. I've already paid for someone to take responsibility for making that broadband work. So there's no way I would buy that service from OpenReach. BT Wholesale would buy it from OpenReach as part of their cost in providing the broadband they sell me. Concrete example, um, reported line out sync, possibly misjumpered. Turned out it was misjumpered, clear fault in the broadband. And uh, so the service we buy from BT Wholesale was broken. BT replied in five seconds, stating there was no fault and trying to sell us an SFI engineer, even though BT had tested the line and confirmed it met SIN 349. So they know it meets SIN 349, but they're trying to sell us a service to test the line SIN 349 for a fee. That's dodgy. Um, they provide no means to progress the fault, to have the fault investigated and fixed. Now, the contract says BT will investigate and fix faults, but there's no means to in this case, and in many cases. The only option is to... Um, buy an optional service to test line SIN 349. BT refused to tell us a process to follow to have such faults fixed without buying an optional service, even though BT contract says they will fix faults. Where, where's our option to get faults fixed? Um, basically, wholesale need to stop offering a pointless optional third party service that no one needs to buy. BT wholesale need to recognize that faults that are not necessarily a failure of SIN 349, including sync below fault threshold, packet loss, latency, misjumping, PPP level errors, BMAS errors, everything else, where a lot of their systems will say no fault. They need to recognize that there are faults. Uh, BT need to use their own BT PLC SFI engineers from OpenReach to go and fix broadband faults at their cost, just like they used any other engineers to go and fix fiber backholes or, or telephone exchanges or BMASs at their cost. Fault fixing is part of what we already buy. Um, now, I'm quite happy to accept a wild goose chase clause as acceptable. If we don't do our job of testing the CPE and the guy goes out and it's on fire or something, then we've not done our job. It's fair there's a penalty for us not doing our job, not doing what we've agreed and sending you on a wild goose chase. And that's okay. There's no problem. As long as you provide proof of that. Just going out and saying didn't find a fault must be you is not good enough. Because the same applies to us changing the customer's kit, not finding a fault, so it must be BT. The argument works both ways. So yes, if you can prove that it was definitely something at the customer's premises that caused the problem, you've got a picture of the faulty router, some proof of the problem, then we're more than happy to say we failed, partly because with that proof we can charge our customer, because they didn't do what they said. So we don't get, we don't get burdened with that because we didn't go wrong. If we forgot to ask our customer to check it, then yes, we, we, we pay. It's our cost. But if we asked our customer to check it, and they said, yeah, yeah, everything's fine, it's all plugged in, and the engineer goes out, and it's just not even, you know, plugged into or whatever, the lights don't come on the router, the power supply's banged, something like that, and the customer never checked, then we can go back to our customer and say, you didn't check, we've had this cost, you've got to pay. There's no option, really, where we should pay as long as we do our bit. So... Provide evidence, don't just jump to conclusions. Is FTTC the future? The logic behind BT charging for an extra service to fix broadband, open reach charging, is because they only sell a metallic path and anything above that is more than they're selling. So it makes sense for that to be a chargeable service that wholesale should pay. But with FTTC, open reach is selling VDSL. Broadband faults are their responsibility because they're selling broadband to wholesale. So there should never be an SFI for FTTC. It's faulty, fix it. Simple. Problem is, there isn't a clear definition of what a fault is. There needs to be a definition of acceptable random packet loss, i.e. when there's not routers filling buffers, it's idle packet loss. Acceptable idle latency, again, when routers aren't filling buffers to cause the latency to be full. Acceptable levels of resyncs. Acceptable levels of sync speed up and down, 
based on the original forecast. And all of those need to be clear cut, well defined, testable criteria for what a fault is that everyone agrees from open reach right through to the end user. Then there's no ambiguity. Thank you very much. That's the end of that.